Derek Cotton is a chef, educator, entrepreneur, and family man. Likely this is the best description for Derek. Beginning his career when he was just 14 years old, he began to work his way up in industry. He achieved his interprovincial journeyman cook in 1996 and, is, and his certified chef de cuisine in 2006. Derek won Apprentice of the Year for Saskatchewan twice. He has won multiple competitions over the years and was recognized as Chef of the Year in 2018. He opened his own restaurant in 2008 and successfully operated that until the opportunity to work at Saskatchewan Polytech in a leadership role started in 2015. He is madly proud of his family, his wife of 28 years, Charlene, and his daughter, Rochelle, who just this year achieved her Juris Doctorate and Master of Laws. Awesome. A quick shout out to his dogs, Elliot and Benny. Yep, can't forget them. In his free time, Derek is a sci-fi and fantasy nerd and collects toys. His family has a high tolerance for him. <laughs> food, and just a, a quote from him is, food is our great unifier. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Derek Cotton. Because I, I tested positive for COVID and I really wished I could have been there today, um, I'm at home and uh, uh, unprepared to, I guess, kind of um, uh, do this at home. So I have dogs as, as uh, um, uh, the, they had said. Um, my wife works out of the office and my daughter might come home from work soon. So if you hear some loudness and that, I apologize in advance. Um, I also just wanted to recognize that I live and work in Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of Métis people. I'm going to try and share my screen here. And can you guys see that? If anybody could let me know. Yes, we can see it. Well, you I could maybe go out. full screen with it. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. All righty. So um, I'm here to talk today just about kind of kitchens and equipment. And so so who am I? And I didn't realize he was going to read my bio out loud. I just thought it was kind of part of a package. So um, I am a career chef. Um, I was a chef for 30 odd years before I kind of got into the education side of things. Um, I have mostly lived and worked in uh, Saskatoon, but I've competed and done a bunch of other things. And um, what does that matter, I guess? And and uh, it it kind of matters because it's about what I have to offer. So um, what do I offer? Um, well, I took this position um, because I believe in food. As as I said, food's the kind of the great unifier for me. And and in um, uh, North American culture, I feel like we have a really um, poor food culture within there. So we kind of uh, eat and leave, and it's uh, I I feel like it could be better. And I feel like uh, you know, food doesn't uh, food, food doesn't have gender, food doesn't have uh, uh, race, it doesn't have anything. It just brings people together um, in a way that uh, uh, you know promotes community and wellness. And so, uh, for what I have to offer all of of you is um, my years of expertise. I guess um, I would I go to sites, I, I look at what they have, and I try and figure out how I can help make it better with with within my area of expertise. So I look at flow of the kitchens, how to store things, what equipment could be provided, all of that sort of, those items are kind of what I bring to the table. And this is a list of a bunch of questions that uh, um, I was asked to maybe try and briefly speak on. And um, I have a poor memory because I'm older now. So um, I have to write them down and and I kind of wanted to touch on each of them, even though each of them in itself is probably um, uh, um, a long conversation. Um, so why did I think it's important for schools to participate in in this and and what do they need to hear? Well, it's like I said, food's a great unifier. I think if we can um, uh, bring people together at the table at these young age, especially underprivileged or, or you know, families that are struggling and stuff, and give them uh, uh, um, a focus, uh, uh, have a, a stable offering for them, and, and build that community up as people go there. I think that we'll have success for them uh, in 
in their futures and, and where they move forward to. So I think it's really important that 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 food and the community that that food brings um, helps. And then what to be considered when it comes to scaling up? Um, well, that's a complicated question as well. Um, scaling up is complicated uh, for people who know how to do it. And 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 I, I, I know how to scale up food. I know how to go from serving 50 people to 500. Um, it doesn't make it any easier that I know how to do it, but it, it definitely um, helps me with my planning and preparation as I get there. And um, all the nutrition workers bring a lot of value and, and they have um, uh, all of their own attributes to, to offer. But the one thing that they need is uh, probably a little bit of help and how and that too. And, and I think that that how is, is something that gets missed because uh, we don't have a lot of time to spend with, with the nutrition workers to get them to, that, to the how. So the, the scaling up, I think, is one of those things that just is going to come with practice and doing, but you know, it's going to be more helpful if we have some training and stuff like that early on. Uh, common barriers, providing access to food for all students. Uh, Budget uh, probably is the one that uh, is the the biggest elephant in the room, I think. Um, and uh, uh, there's other things, uh, accessibility, um, you know, the location of the schools, uh, um, infrastructure, uh, all those things kind of come into to play. And and so then the next question was, how can some of these barriers be easily resolved? And well, I guess the short answer is, I'm not, I'm not sure any of them are going to be easily resolved. Um, however, I do believe that uh, um, where there's a will, there's a way. And so I think that, uh, you know, with talking to other people and, and working out things together, that we can find ways to try and um, resolve them or, or try and make progress on them. Um, and, and then the next thing was <clears throat> considerations to be made providing health really quotient culturally important food is prioritized. Uh, um, there are, because there, there's lots of considerations. Um, there's all kinds of dietary restrictions, uh, uh, nutritious food, uh, you know, still gets touted as boring food or, you know, um, kids will always eat chicken fingers before they'll eat broccoli likely. Um, you know, um, if you haven't grown up with food, so you're eating food from a different culture, sometimes, you know, that can just be odd, um, yeah, portion size, all those things. So, um, we have to consider all of those things as we as we have schools that have, you know, people from all kinds of different backgrounds, all all different walks of life, and they have what they have. And then children and, and young people as well, too, they have more taste buds active, so they're more food, you know, food sits differently with them. So we do have to consider all of those things, too. But I also think we need to make sure that we open the door for them and and uh, give them the opportunities to try different things. And we have to be aware too that all of those um, aspects of it need to be considered when we're planning. So you know you have to take all the cultures at your school into consideration and all the uh, kind of health things, and you have to find a way to to make your menu. And you also have to do it with the items that you're either able to order or that have been donated. Um, so it's it's. Um, it, 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 it's not really a barrier, it's probably more of a hurdle, but it needs to be thought out as we go through it. Um, is there anything I would recommend as they consider integrating local, traditional, or wild foods into school-based programming? Um, I don't, I, I, I think we should, I think, I think we, we should, I think we should be regional, I think we should um, um, show our cultures and our histories through food. Um, I think that they have to just be um, considerate of of the the people that maybe it's new to them or or how any new new food thing um, how people would take it or accept it. I think you need to ease people into some things that are are um, different and and so I think you need to kind of do it with uh, care. Um, but I think it's important too. I think it's very important that uh, people understand um, you know. The lands that they live on and and the the food that's there and the food from the cultures of all the people that are around them um how can community schools start to prepare and think about their kitchens and equipment and should they be interested in expanding or enhancing their school food programs um i'll kind of get to that a little bit later um this is my most wordy slide and we're halfway through so um 
the model for centralized kitchens and densely populated areas. Um, I do like that idea. I think um, I think the uh, the idea of a centralized kitchen that would uh, sort of deliver more prepared food instead of working it at each place uh, saves on cost um, would make a difference in how um, you would approach it. Um, the the need for having these uh, large size or large scale kitchens um, at every school. Um, so I do like that idea for the the more densely populated areas. Um, you know, we do live in Saskatchewan, and so we have a lot of rural, and we have places that are farther away. And I think that that needs to be con considered as to then, you know, you don't want to put all the money in the bigger centers because that tends never to work out. So. Uh, what could schools hoping to plan ideal school food programs consider as they move forward? Um, I think that um, it's challenging, but I think that um, it's the right thing to do. And I guess that's what I would have to say about that one. Um, kids should eat. It shouldn't um, be an issue and, and it, it, it'll help, you know, nurture the body, nurture the mind and, and, and allow them to, um, and become who they really want to be. So I think that in that sense, um, I think that that's the reason that we should do it is that it's really just the right thing to do. And and we should, and we shouldn't have to consider that our, our, our kids wouldn't eat or that they, you know, may go hungry. And that I think that they will be in a position to better themselves by having the food, having a safe place, and then, you know, nurture their mind through that. So in that said, um, I thought about the top three things that I could, uh, I guess, recommend to, to everybody that I thought made the most sense as I was reading through those questions and trying to consider them as a whole and still trying to um, have it uh, be meaningful and impactful to, to everybody. So, the first thing I thought about was collaboration. So um, I think it's really important if I've noticed anything from the school systems that I, I think I find, and I find this at Saskatchewan Polytechnic as well, is a lot of silos happen and and, and they, they happen both naturally and unnaturally, I think, but I think it's important to collaborate for the people that are doing the work. I think it's important that they talk to people in 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 other schools and other areas about what they're doing, about what's working for them, about what's not. The ability to share and connect, um, even to have um, people be frustrated and be able to vent their frustrations out a little bit, and and then work to a solution with somebody who who understands what they're going through. So I think the ability to collaborate, um, work well with others, and um, you know, just just to get be able to get input and feedback from them uh, matters, and and I think that that could go a long way into how and 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 why people would want to work together, and uh, because you get the like-minded people doing the same things, you would be able to uh, share successes and and kind of talk about the things, or even hear what they're doing that is something interesting that you might to do. So I think the ability to Kind of broaden it and and put yourselves in a position of collaboration would be would be a very valuable asset. Um, community, I think um, uh, the building of community is important, and I, I know many of the, the the schools and spaces do this already. And I think it's important that um, you know we we show and build community amongst ourselves, and and I think food's a great way to do that, but also. I think our communities have expertise in some things, and and I think that uh, you know we need to not be afraid sometimes to uh, tap people on their shoulder and and maybe kind of get a bit of goodwill from them in in those things too. Everybody brings something valuable, and so I think that by um, utilizing this program to to build the community that we want to see with all the 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 folks that we have in in all of our different communities. Is going to be a way to expand and um, uh, uh, put us in a position that maybe some of the barriers or, or hurdles that we're seeing in front of us, maybe they're not quite so bad because we're using some of that um, expertise and and resourcing that we have um, uh, to try and uh, fulfill that without kind of having to go to something that maybe costs more or to pay somebody to to do it. So I think the the value of community not only from um, 
uh, bringing everybody together and having cohesion in that too, but also about the utilization of everybody's expertise would be really valuable. Um, especially as we start expanding out, I think that that would be really important. And kind of the third thing, and probably the biggest thing for everybody is equipment and training. And um, I, equipment and training is, a, is it's a really funny thing. Um, so efficiencies are a lot of what I try to look at and try to um, help people with and to to bring to them. And so the the one thing that I think I kind of, fully recommend to all of the different um, uh, schools that are looking at this is to buy a Roboku, which is the picture of the food processor in the top left there on my slide. Um, a Roboku is a commercial food processor. Um, it'll probably save about three weeks of labor a year when you're doing some of your larger bulk pieces of, of um, processing that you're trying to do. I know often, and, and this happened to me through my career as well too, that people go out to buy a food processor from Walmart or whatever, and uh, um, they're great for the two months that they work and then they just kind of putter out. And so um, they're, because they're not built to work that long that fast, and that's why the commercial products uh, tend to last a lot longer and a lot better. So, so I think that that's a, a really valuable piece of equipment that, that I wouldn't, uh, um, uh, I would recommend to probably every school to have one of those. Um, you know, the uh, one thing that I've seen in many of the places that I've I visited is as well is 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 proper dishwashing. Uh, many places uh, don't have; they have the little undercounter dishwashers and uh, really no sinks. The same kind of sink that you would you know kind of see in your grandma's house, like just a small um, sink that doesn't have a. Um, you know, enough depth to it. Although I've heard some of the things, things are so deep, you know, that, that uh, um, it's not good for short people. But um, the the having a proper sink to to be allow your products, you know, your 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 dirty products to to soak a little bit um, while you're doing your other things. I think dishwashing and and uh, the cleaning of of the the cooking equipment. Um, takes quite a bit of time, and I think it's made harder by not having uh, the right spaces and depths of equipment that that you could use to do that. So the dishwashing, I think, is and and the sinks are are a really important aspect that needs to be looked at. Um, the storage, I guess, would be another thing. Many of the places I've gone to seem to have um, cabinets on everything, as if you're at your house. Um, I'm not a huge fan of cabinets. Um, I like all the, the shelving to be open and um, I like it to be something that I can just see where the product is and grab it as I need it. Um, and it's a strange thing as well, too, because the those product, it, it seems like such a simple thing, but it will shave lots of time off from the opening and closing or the having to look around for things. It'll make a big difference long term about how people look at it. Um, also with knives, uh, having... Um, you know, everybody's going to use knives in the kitchen. It's the piece of equipment we use the most, making sure that they're sharp, they're well taken care of. Um, that's going to make a big difference. It's going to help everybody um, be more efficient and, and um, more directed on what they do. Um, and so a lot of those things, uh, a, good, a good blender goes far, depending on the kinds of things that you do. And I, know, I also know from an equipment standpoint, it kind of matters a bit per location, like there's not necessarily a one fix for everything. Some of it I think is quite common, but I think other items are very uncommon. So kind of most of the things that I've talked about within there are probably under the $4,000 marker. I mean, they for sure are, it depends on the, the capacity which you do them in. And the, the other thing that always has to be considered is the installation of them. Um, you know, sometimes those things, electrical components, plumbing, drainage, uh, all of that can cost. And so when we're looking at those things, we need to make sure. Um, and that's where kind of getting some help from the community or, or uh, other expertise within our area could help us out with what, what that could look like. Um, one of the items that we've started purchasing at SAS Polytech, and they're expensive, and and um, the, but they make a huge, huge difference, and they're going to last like you know, 15 or 20 years or more. And that's the, the oven that's uh, depicted in the lower left there. Um, that's called an iCombi oven. Um, it, uh, 
The good thing about an oven like this is it's electric. It'll come with its own hood and it has a water feed. So it acts like a steamer. It acts like a um, an oven. It can kind of grill and roast. Uh, you could put your roast in it uh, at the end of your shift, set it for the temperature you want it to cook for, program it, and walk away. And when you come in the next day, it's just done. And it's it's taken that whole time to cook and it's kind of cooled down effectively and it's everything's within um, parameters. Um, it give you more room to cook things and it it's really works as like three to five pieces of kitchen equipment at all times. Uh, because they're self-ventilated, um, you don't need to have a hood system underneath it. So um, anything in, that emits gaseous vapors is considered to be a, a piece of equipment that needs a, a hood or a ventilation system that it sits underneath. And that's the good thing about those is you don't need to consider the hood or ventilation system because they kind of come with their own uh, in effect. And um, so those are quite expensive, but like I said, they they would make a long term difference down the road. I think the the, the training as well matters. Knowing how to use equipment properly, knowing um, what's the best way to do it, the the care of it, um, those things are all going to matter because then they're going to last for a lot longer. Um, kitchen equipment tends to not be very cheap. Everything's made of stainless steel and heavy duty, and so you know when you're spending two four. Ten, fifteen thousand dollars on items. You want them to last as long as possible. Um, so, I I would think it's very important that uh, um, you know we we kind of uh, look at make sure that people understand how they're to work and how the training should be for it, so that it makes it simpler and easier for people to go, and also that they can realize too. Um, the different things that the the piece of equipment can do. It's really easy to sit there and say a food processor can, uh, you know, shred carrots or 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 you know, shred cheese and stuff like that. But it also can emulsify and it also can you know puree and and do all these other things. So it has um, a, a greater value of it. One thing that I didn't have a picture of, but I think might be handy for a lot of places as well as a vacuum sealer. Um, uh, especially as we use vacuum sealers a lot more um, nowadays and uh, reasonably what a vacuum sealer does is it just sucks all the air out of whatever packaging you have. So anywhere from items that go into the cooler or the freezer, you're building shelf life into them. And, uh, you know, those would be under that uh, um, four to $6,000 marker, depending on the size that you would need. Um, the the reason that that would be important is uh, because of food waste and and frankly the cost of food right now is is ridiculous, and so food waste becomes a really big big issue because um, any food that you make create or or have in stock that you end up throwing in the bin ends up having no long term value to you because it just went into the garbage. So any ways that we can find to be more sustainable to minimize our food waste. Um, will help all of our budgets and all of the 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 way that we're trying to move in order to help have these things and secure them. And that's pretty much all I have. It's very I haven't presented like this for a long time, so um, it's quiet and I don't hear anything. And I'm not sure if there's any questions, but I'm happy to answer them um, if I if I can or if there's any questions people have about something I didn't talk about, I'd be happy to answer. Thanks, Derek. Um, I have a question. Uh, so I know you've visited, uh, you've gone and done tours at four, I believe, of the MLTC community schools, and you've done the same in a couple of schools here in Saskatoon. Um, would you tell us a little bit about that process, um, in part because I think there's some schools in the room that would probably benefit from you coming and taking a look at what they have as far as facilities go um, and giving them some advice. Thank you. It's, um, um, it's I, I pretty much go in and uh, it kind of sounds dumb when I say it out loud, but I, I look around and I try and see what could be better. I look at the age of things. I look at how um, they're trying to do their service and, and, and how they're trying to um, uh, um, do what, what they're being asked to do. And that's whether it's a uh, breakfast, a snack, or, um, um, 
sorry, I'm reading a chat that I caught, and so I get sidetracked really easy. Um, it 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 matters to start looking at it from an efficiency and effectiveness um, standpoint. So the when you go in and you see a place and then they have like just household sinks and you see kind of the Walmart food processors and they just, you know, they have a um, a household stove and, you know, that you know that they're going to serve two or 300 um, meals that day and that stoves is not built to do that and or they don't have the right size of pots. And so they're instead of making one pot of whatever the item is. They're making, um, you know, they have four pots trying to make for the same item, or they don't have enough freezer or storage space, or just even the the layout, the layout that they can control um, uh, doesn't make sense. Um, most of what I see when I come in is uh, they, uh, they're just older facilities that probably weren't built to, to do what what we're we're asking them to do, and so. They kind of just need a bit of an upgrade or a lift, but um, not not all of it is brutally expensive either. Um, sometimes just getting the right table can make a big difference, or a good cutting board, or or any of that. So, did that answer the question? Sorry. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. I have a question in, in terms of training. You you mentioned that training is one of the the three sort of crucial bits there. Um, lots of the schools are sort of operating with you know a mom or a community member uh, who doesn't have any food service training um, handling their lunch program uh, so i'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, what sort of training supports certi certifications that kind of thing that um you know your average mom could get or schools could support um, their food service staff in getting you know, it's um, um, it's one of those things. I think that um, you know, besides having your food safe certification and stuff, uh, mo most of what it is is by working with somebody who kind of knows what to do. I I think the best benefit would be is that if um, you know, in in order to help support them and and they can get some people in that can help them work with what they have. Um, it's it's really easy. You know, if if I were to tour you guys all through this Ask Polly kitchen, you would. You, you would think it's great. It's very shiny. It's very large. Um, it, there's a lot of things that we have there. And um, it, it doesn't do um, uh, somebody who's working in a smaller facility any good to see that because what really matters is how they use and work within the, the space that they have. So I think by, by bringing in somebody that is, um, you know, um, can, can kind of just look at it, you know, with a, a different perspective, um, and and from a professional perspective as well too about how how perhaps this could work better I think that would be the most helpful and to just to spend a bit of time working with them and as long as they're the the nutrition worker would be um, you know open to uh, uh, a bit of change that could work in their favor down the road I think that that would probably be the best way and I, I think from what I had said about community as well too sometimes there's community members that even could you know help with that a little bit. Okay, that looks to be all of the questions in the room. Um, I guess thank you, uh, Derek, for your time today. All right, thanks everybody. I really wish I could be there with you. I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions now or down the road, um, my email's in the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out to me and I will happily get in contact with you. Thank you for allowing me to present you today. Thanks, Derek. Sorry, just one quick thing I wanted to say is that um, there are opportunities for Derek to come and take a look at your facilities and give you some advice on how to use your facilities um, as efficiently as possible. So if you are interested and you haven't already had a visit from, uh, from Derek, um, please do let us know. I think we have a sign-up sheet at the front um, and uh, we, will, we will arrange to have Derek come to your community and uh, and take a look at your facilities and give you some advice on how to and how to use what you currently have and then if you if you have the ability to invest um, to to what what would be um, what would be the most efficient way to use that. <laughs>